And now at this time, I would like to turn to the chair of the Education and Workforce Committee to begin our opening session. I'd like to now turn it over to Governor Bentley from the great state of Alabama. Thank you, Governor McAuliffe. I'm honored today to be a, a, a part of this program because I, I truly believe that, that early childhood education is the most impor important part of education. Uh, governors from both sides of the aisle acknowledge the critical importance of this bipartisan issue to our children's future and the vibrancy of our state's economies. They are championing the initiatives to improve the quality of and expand access to early learning programs in their states. In recognizing the significance of this ongoing work in states, Later this afternoon, we will vote to adopt NGA's first ever policy position on early childhood education and make it a top priority as we work with Congress and the President to ensure that all children re receive a strong start on their education. Last year, more than 14,500 four-year-olds in Alabama were enrolled in our high-quality first-class pre-K program. That's 25% of all of our four-year-olds. Now, that's a wonderful start, but we recognize there is still more work to do. And I'm encouraged by this new policy, and I'm excited to see early childhood education as a priority across this nation. Together, Governor Inslee and I are challenging all governors to help us rethink the federal early education landscape to reflect the innovation taking place in our states. And today, we are honored to continue that discussion with advocates for a strong start for our children. At this point, I would like to turn the program over to our Vice Chairman, Governor Jay Inslee. Uh, he and I have witnessed some exciting things in education during our time on this committee. And Governor, I'm honored to chair this Education Workforce Committee with you. Thank you, Governor. What a great day for the NGA. This is a historic day. Uh, you're going to see a lot of big bipartisan smiles today around this issue. Uh, we know the neuroscience is clear that if you want to invest in a person's improvement and economic success, this is the single best time to do it at age three and four. That is clear. But on a personal level, I can tell you every governor agrees with this. It's great to go to ribbon cuttings when we build bridges. It's great to go to uh, signing ceremonies of glorious bills, but there is nothing better than seeing the smile on a three or four year old kid's face when they learn to count to 10 and you know they're going to be ready to kindergarten because that kid's one of these days going to figure out how to go to Mars and cure cancer and they're going to make sure they're economically productive. So this really is a joy and it's great that the National Governors Association is now getting in league with the neuroscience about where the single best investment is we can make uh, of our people. And there is a great morality to this effort in addition to economic benefit. Because I think we all ought to understand this, poverty should not be destiny in America. It just should not be your destiny if you, if you draw a bad card and you're born into poverty. We want to eliminate that opportunity gap that is pernicious in our society. And we know the single best way to do it is with a three and four year old early child uh, education. So we've set uh, a goal of having 90% of our kids ready for kindergarten by 2020. We're not there yet, but we're moving fast in the state of Washington. I just want to share some of the things we've done because I think it's things that we can do in, in all of our states. Number one, we have uh, adopted a new uh, quality rating and improvement system for those who provide early child education because we know that quality counts in everything and it certainly counts in early child education. Second, we've made preschool and an entitlement program for all income eligible families. These kids ought to be first on our claim of scarce resources, not last. So we've made sure that this is an entitlement program for these kids. Third, we've made a specific investment for at risk kids. We know we have some little angels that if they get a little extra help at age three and four, they're going to do great in the rest of their career. Fourth, we have helped our providers. And I think this is really important because we have a lot of providers who might be recent uh, immigrants to the country. We have uh, people who are uh, kind of at the bottom of the economic ladder. And so we are providing great scholarship programs for our providers 
so that they can work on their own, on their own quality improvement. And fifth, we've done the thing that's most obvious, but uh, we've got we've to make sure we do. We've increased our number of slots by 50% in the last uh, three and a half years. We want to get to where we need to be to eliminate the opportunity gap well down the road. So I want to thank Republican governors, Democratic governors, who understand that if you're going to do economic investment, the best place you can start is with a three and four year old. We're all about jobs, and you're going to have jobs, you got to have three and four year olds that are going to have their full dreams uh, realized beginning at that age. Now we have uh, some tremendous leaders here to join us tonight. We're here today. We have Jennifer Garner and Mark uh, Shriver. I'm going to introduce them in a minute. Uh, we've got Mike uh, uh, Petters, CEO of Huntington Ingalls Industry, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, Jennifer Garner, this is a woman I got to meet to my campaign and talk about a whirling der dervish when it comes to inspiring people around uh, this subject. She holds many, many exalted titles. The first and the most important one is mother, and I will put that first on your resume. But she's got a great uh, uh, work, as we know, in her acting career. She's a member of our Save Our, Our Children organization. And importantly, this is a person who uh, puts herself on the line. She's gone to West Virginia. She's gone to Capitol Hill, California's Central Valley, Kentucky and West Virginia to understand the effects of poverty, how important this is for a poverty reduction effort. And I can introduce now Mark Schreiber, who's president of Save the Children Action Network. Uh, he and Jennifer have done more than probably anybody in the country to inject the word quality in her early child education. We're following her lead. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much, Governor, and good morning, everyone. Thank you, Governor McAuliffe, Governor Sandoval. Thank you so much for having us. Governor Bentley, it's great to be with you again. Um, Jen and I have traveled all across the country over the last nine years, and I uh, met Governor Bentley about six years ago in the great state of Alabama, and the work that you've done um, expanding Save the Children's work uh, across your great state in Green and Clark and Washington counties, pulling together the Chamber of Commerce and other entities across Alabama is greatly admired and greatly appreciated, and it's a role model for the rest of the country. Governor Inslee, uh, we met you before you actually declared running for uh, governor. Jen and I were in Washington State, and Save the Children's work in Lake Quinault and Grace Harbor and Pacific counties uh, is greatly appreciated, and we want to say thank you. We want to Thank you, uh, Governor Bentley, again, for that great announcement that's going to happen uh, in a couple of hours, putting the issue of early childhood education, high-quality early childhood education, at the forefront of the National Governors Association. It is so exciting. Um, so thank you very much, Governor. Many of you know of Save the Children as a international non-governmental organization that does work in education and in health, does disaster relief work. But it was actually started here in the United States almost 100 years ago in New York City and then focused in on providing meals for poor children in Kentucky. And that led to the federal lunch, school lunch program. And our work has continued all across this country uh, for almost the last 100 years. And Jennifer joined us as an artist ambassador about nine years ago, focused on the issue of early childhood education here in America. Uh, Save the Children does work internationally and does great work in 120 countries. But our roots are here in, in America. It's uh, really rooted in Kentucky but also across the country, from the East Coast to the West Coast. So it gives me a great honor to introduce our artist ambassador for the last nine years, someone I've traveled all across the country, uh, from California to Washington to Kentucky to South Carolina, um, and uh, is a great role model, as the governor said, uh, for all of us who are interested in expanding high-quality early childhood education, Jennifer Gardner. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Governor Inslee and Governor Bentley. Um, it is really exciting and thrilling to be in a room full of people who have, are giving their lives to service to our country. And I'm honored to be here and grateful to be part of this conversation. Believe me, when I started working for SAVE nine years ago, the thought of, the, uh, the thought of early education being part of a national conversation was something that was very far off in the distance. And so it's, it's really thrilling to see everyone here and committed and, and ready to get to work. Um, first, just to let you know how I got into this in the first place. My mom grew up uh, poor, dirt poor, with 10 siblings, no electricity or running water in Dust Bowl Depression, Oklahoma. 
She managed somehow to get herself educated, the only member of her family to go to college. Eventually, mom and dad landed in, my sisters and me, in Charleston, West Virginia, where we grew up middle class, surrounded by generational rural poverty, the kind where kids' shoes are cut along the front to let their toes grow out, the kind where my friends from first grade didn't make it to second grade when I did, didn't make it to third grade when I did, and somehow disappeared off the face of the earth as far as I knew in my little elementary school mind. I grew up one generation and one holler removed from poverty. Awareness and gratitude are pretty powerful motivators and they've driven me to think about big things like how do we, how did my mom get out and how can I help other kids like the ones I grew up close to. Um, and so I hunted down the organization that at the time and still I believe had the most efficacy in helping kids get out of generational rural poverty in the United States, and that was Save the Children. It was run by Mark Shriver. Mark and I have had the great luck and fortune, and it does, believe me, when you're going into someone's trailer home that's um, surrounded by trash, that has plastic over a broken window, that has the oven door open to heat the small space, that is infested by cockroaches or and that has not an ounce of sound or joy in the place, you do feel privileged to be allowed into people's homes and to be accepted and welcomed into a place where they could actually just feel shame and not want you to take a look inside. Um, when we walk into these homes, you would be suffocated by the silence in the rooms. The children are not babbling, they are not talking, they are not crying, they are not making joyful sounds or anything else. That's because their senses are dulled. Their mothers and fathers are so overwhelmed by the stressors of living in poverty. Food scarcity, not knowing where they're gonna live, drug addiction, abuse, you all know the drill better than I. But their mothers are so overwhelmed that they don't have the, the capacity to look outside themselves, and I'm sure they have not had the modeling like I'm sure many of us had from great parents. They don't have the capacity to look outside themselves and read to their babies, sing to their babies, speak to and, and love on their babies. They sit their babies in front of a television, and I've seen it over and over again across this country, and the child quietly goes to sleep inside their mind. Well, if the brain grows between birth and five, then we are doing these children a great disservice because they have absolutely lost the chance to ever make it ahead in, in life. If, if, by, if you're growing up in poverty, by four years old, you are a year and a half behind developmentally. So you're a two and a half year old. How's it gonna feel when you start kindergarten? 60% of kids in rural America start kindergarten in special ed. Special ed in kindergarten, it doesn't make sense. We all know that. But there is an answer, and the answer is starting earlier and earlier and earlier. And as much as I believe and applaud all of you who are putting money and efforts into helping kids at three and four year olds, Governor Inslee, I challenge you to look at birth to three and ask you to think about what you are doing for those newborns. <laughs> In the last couple of years, I have visited Governor Ines Inslee's um, Quinault Indian Nation in Washington, Governor Justice's Calhoun County in my home state of West Virginia, Governor Haslam's Eastern Tennessee, Governor McMaster's Bishop, South Carolina, where our programs are so, so needed, and the money for them was cut yesterday, and I'm coming after him, Governor Bevins, Berea, Kentucky, and Governor Bryant's Alligator, Mississippi. I am. I am um, thrilled to tell you that there is so much optimism in getting to a mother and a child early. I have a story that I love, that um, I was visiting a family in a, a concrete home in the heat of Central Valley, California. There was a little boy there, he was 11 months old. When I walked into the house, at the time I had about a 10 month old little boy who's turning five on Monday. Um, this little boy was 11 months old. He didn't look up, he didn't smile, he didn't react to me at all. He was sitting in front of an episode of Oprah and um, 
that was kind of where his, his focus was, and I, she's wonderful. I hope he got something from her. Um, the mother also looked depressed, overwhelmed, exhausted, and I can understand why. Her life didn't look like anything that I would want to lead. This little boy was stagnant. The Save the Children coordinator came in and she brought something for this child along with a book bag of books and a log for the mother to fill out for every time she was reading to her child and encouragement and love, she brought a ball. This little boy had never seen a ball. Imagine your own children, imagine your son with his first ball. This kid kind of looked at that ball and he looked at his mom, and his mom just was putting up with us, frankly. And the, the Save the Children coordinator said, roll that ball to your son. She did. She rolled it to him. And he looked at it and couldn't believe what was happening, and he rolled it back. And the mother kind of sat there, and the coordinator said, he's playing with you. He's playing with you. Do it again. Do it again. She rolled it to him again. But soon there was a Is that my time? Okay. Gosh, it's like the Oscars. You guys are so scary. <laughs> All right. Well, can I tell you what happened with the mom and child? <laughs> the mother, the baby made a noise. The baby made a noise. And the coordinator said, he's talking to you. And she said, he's not talking to me. And she said, he is. This is speech. This is connection. It's happening. Say the same thing back to him. And the mother did, kind of embarrassed. And the child said it back. And the next thing you know, they were babbling back and forth. And I'm telling you, I saw a light switch go on for that little boy on that day. And I know that because we visited that mother a week later, that light switch was turned on just long enough for us to catch her a week later and a week after that and a week after that. And there was a connection made there. And the mother knew she could play with her child, knew she could speak to her child and expect a response, knew she was, she was then encouraged to read to her child. And that kid had a chance to go to kindergarten ready to learn. Thank you so much, and please call on me if I can ever be part of coming to your state and introducing you to our great programs. And Governor McMaster, I'll speak with you soon. <laughs>
Uh, we met with Governor Bryan from Mississippi. A lot of states we know are struggling with financial issues. Uh, you're making tough cuts. Uh, but as Governor Inslee, I think, and Governor Bentley both said, this is not only an education issue, it's a workforce development issue. Um, and there are ideas out there that are percolating in states in very early stages, the social impact bonds concept, which we just mentioned, uh, that can look at funding uh, the expansion of high quality care. So we want to work with you. We hope you'll reach out. Uh, we want to work with your uh, constituents in pursuing some of these ideas. And Governor Inslee, we turn it back over to you. And Governor Bentley, we'd love, uh, Jennifer and I would love to answer any questions if any members, uh, any governors have any questions. So thank you again so much, Governor Bentley, and your uh, committee for shining a spotlight on this issue. As Jennifer said, it is an incredibly exciting moment in the history and the development of this important issue. Thanks so much. Well, <laughs> Mark, uh, you and Jennifer, I, I I want to not only thank you for being on our panel today, but I want to thank you for your passion for something that I truly have the passion for. Uh, because as a physician, uh, you know, I saw, just like Jennifer talked about, uh, I saw a child at eight months of age who was vibrant and, and then at four years of age, totally dull. And, and so it's real. And, and that, that brain develops, and we have to take advantage of, of the development of that child's brain. And so thank you, and, and thank you for your passion. And we're, we are going to have some questions. Uh, we're going to call on some governors here in, in just a minute. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we have to uh, be concerned about in our states, of course, is money. Obviously, as governors, we have to deal with that. Uh, in Alabama, what we've done is we've increased uh, our pre-K funding in the state by between 10 and $20 million every year. That's why we've gone from 6% uh, to 25%. We're trying to get to the 50% level because then everyone will have the opportunity, if they choose, to go to a first-class pre-K program. Uh, the thing that has helped us tremendously has been the federal dollars that have been provided for us over the last three years. Uh, the $17 million that we received each year uh, helped us start new programs. And then the money that we put in on the state level sustained those programs. Uh, and so that's how we've approached it uh, in the state of Alabama. Uh, so now I'd like to kick off our discussion by asking uh, some of the other governors uh, to ask questions of, of Mark and Jennifer. Uh, so uh, we, will, we will open this up. Governor Wolf? Yeah, I have a question. I uh, thank you very much, Ms. Garner and, and Mr. Shriver, and also Governor Inslee and Governor Bentley for your championing. I'm, I'm trying to be heard here. The, uh, I, I want to I say something and then ask a question. The, the, in Pennsylvania, we take this really seriously. Getting our youngest citizens off to the right start in life is really important, as you point out. Um, in my 17-18 budget, I proposed a 40% increase in early childhood education between Head Start and early childhood education. And the goal is to get to 44,000 new pre-K seats by the year 2020. Um, and this is a good investment. Uh, Mark, you said you, you're talking thirteen to $17,000 per student. It depends on the area. Maybe $8,000 in some cases can do a good job in early childhood education. By contrast, it costs over $40,000 a year to incarcerate somebody. $40,000 a year. This is a good investment. Uh, and it, 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 there are all kinds of other factors that you, you have to weigh. If a child gets off to a good start, we avoid paying a lot of the other social costs that, that we would pay if we didn't do this. So in a year when Pennsylvania has a very stressed budget, uh, I'm proposing a big increase in this because this, I think, is a, a smart investment. But as you pointed out, Jennifer, the, the, uh, uh, you would like to see birth through three. Are there any models out there in, in the states uh, that you think are doing a good job in the birth through three area? Or Mark? Either one. You want, you want me to start? Okay. I always ask permission. Um, when I know I'm I'll interrupt, so go I, ahead. You just did. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there are, um, Governor, there are a number of, of excellent models that are funded through the McVie funding uh, revenue stream from the federal government. Save the Children, as Jennifer mentioned, runs a uh, early childhood program, home visiting model called Early Steps to School Success. 
Uh, there's parents as teachers. There's the Nurse Family Partnership. There are a number of great models that are running in all of your states right now. Um, I was a former legislator in Maryland for eight years. And I know everybody comes in and asks every one of you for dough all day long. And I think the question that you, that the really good legislators that we've met and the great governors we've met with, whether it was Governor Barber in Mississippi or um, Governor Haslam in, in Tennessee when we met a couple of years ago, they ask, you know, what the ROI is. Uh, because these are, these are investment dollars and they're scarce. And I think you've got to ask all the providers uh, that are providing services, including Save the Children, not how many more kids they're serving, but are the kids entering kindergarten ready to learn? Are the kids at three or four years of age through various um, f uh, standards doing better than they would be if they were not getting any services? And I think those are tough questions to ask because a number of providers have been out doing these services for years. They've got constituencies in the legislature. But I think if we don't ask those tough questions and we don't put some of the entities that have been doing business, frankly, out of business, and fund the ones that are, that have strong track records, that pay for evaluations, that demand a lot out of their staff, then we're shortchanging not only the taxpayers, but ultimately we're shortchanging the kids. And as you said beautifully, Governor, the, the, the concept of paying now or paying much more later uh, is, is true, but you're getting squeezed, right, on your budget, and you've got you to hit your number this year. So we, are under, we understand that. That's why we put together a couple of financing ideas that are in there that are not, that's not code for tax increases. Um, you know, we wrote it in a bipartisan manner, say the Children Action Network works with Republicans and Democrats. We worked uh, with Governor Sununu and his new investment in the state of New Hampshire of $9 million for targeted all-day kindergarten. So there, there are ideas floating around out there, and we just w want to encourage you to ask those tough questions of Save the Children and their Early Steps for School Success Home Visiting Program, nurse fam as I said, Nurse Family Partnership, and, and Parents as Teachers as well. Because when you raise that standard on all of us and demand more from all of us, the kids are going to be the ones that benefit. And that's what makes it exciting. I don't know if you want to add anything. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. That was great. <laughs> okay. Don't get a big head. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, many of your states like mine they have a, a large population of that and we need to, to make some progress there. Uh, similar to Governor Bentley, we participated in that grant process and so I put money in my budget so that we could add thousands of pre-K seats as well. You know, I'm particularly interested in your comments on zero through three. And some of the pushback that we get is, you know, that funding's great, but we don't want it to be babysitting. We, we want it to be mm -hmm. learning as Governor Bryant mm -hmm. talked about. And so I guess my getting to my, my question is, is, you know, we're working hard to get more of those uh, providers certified so that it can be instructional. And, um, and also, what would be your, your comment as well in terms of parents are saying, wait a minute, you know, I, you know, don't take my baby away from me. You know, I, I hear that sometimes. And, and so just trying to help thread that needle in terms of getting the provider certified so that we, they get the instruction that they need so they can be where they need to be. And what would you tell those parents? That, um, that are saying, wait, you know, I want my child at home. Um, thank you very much, Governor Sandoval, and your daughter's adorable. Um, I do not believe that a child needs to leave the home until it is time for preschool in order to learn. I believe we need to support the moms who are raising their children in poverty without enough, without neighbors, without the baby and mommy classes, without the excellent modeling of parents before them. We need to support them and encourage them. And that sometimes is brick by brick, child by child. Something, although I gave you a rough time, Governor Inslee, you actually are doing in this state of Washington because I've gone to visit your programs. Um, and the way that we deal with that at SAVE, since SAVE the Children all over the world, our mandate is to reach the hardest to reach, to do the job no one wants to do. and. We believe that to be true also here in the United States. So we're going out into the fingers of nowhere in your states and seeing people who can't get their children to daycare, who don't have a job to go to if they did, who are growing up, who are raising kids in absolutely the worst possible settings where I am going to the grocery store with them as they try to figure out how to get the most out of their WIC and food stamps money and still have enough left over for their Mountain Dew. Um, these families need our support and our love and that takes us going to them. So the way that we handle it, sir, is that we um, hire people locally, we train them like crazy, so there isn't the feeling of an outsider coming in, and we just form a community around this family and go back again and again and again and just are in her face, assessing her child, figuring out how we can help her. What does she need? Does she need to see a special doctor? Does her child having hearing problems? Is his language delayed and he needs his ears to be looked at by a specialist? Does, does she need a, oh, it's gonna beep on me again, isn't it? I'm gonna get the hook. Does it, <laughs> <laughs> Does she need to, um, you know, is she looking for a ride to a job interview? So that is, that's what our programs focus on, and I, I certainly know that the home visitation model has a place in every single state, and I, I know that all of you are doing it in different ways, and, and I'm grateful. The only thing I would add, Governor, to that is there are ways to evaluate how kids are doing in those first three years of life. So there are, uh, you know, there's something called a Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, which looks at the social, emotional, and cognitive development of kids. Because those first three years of life, when 90% of brain growth happens, um, it happens both cognitively, socially, and emotionally. And a, a little kid going into pre-K or kindergarten doesn't know how to share, doesn't know how to interact with his or her peers, classmates, then those kids are going to struggle academically as well. So it's got to be a comprehensive approach, and there are ways uh, to evaluate whether organizations and, and, and uh, systems are delivering high quality services in that area. The accessibility is obviously a big issue, but accessibility, as Governor Inslee said, without quality uh, is, is not going to do it. It's, it's a, a self-defeating um, uh, approach. So there are entities out there, but we have to look at the kid, the, the child, the baby, really, socially, emotionally, and cognitively uh, when we look at how to expand the accessibility and quality of early childhood and services. Uh, Governor Inslee, do you have a, a final question? Yeah, I, well, I wanted to follow up and then a question on what Governor Sandoval said. W what we found in Washington is you cannot succeed in early child education uh, in a vacuum, in isolation, because other things you do have to be supportive of the early education initiative. 
So one of the things we did first is to try to get the higher education community and the K through 12 education community and that leadership to be advocates for early child education. You've got to have a continuum of education to make this work. I want to mention another thing too. In this quality issue, what we have found is if you want quality, you've got to provide training of the people providing the services. And if you're going to get them training, they got to have a little help to get that training. Now that's just not scholarships. Our Medicaid expansion has been extremely important to a lot of these service providers who are the working poor on Medicaid. And I just mentioned that because we all know we're going to have discussions with the federal government about these Medicaid programs. I would point out that it's hard to have a high quality early child education if their families ended up in the R in a medical bankruptcy situation. So these things got to be related to one another. I hope we're successful. Governor Herbert, could I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, the social benefit fund we heard about in Utah, impact, social be impact fund, do you, do you, can you give us a briefing on that? Or? Well, I, I can, uh, very brief. Uh, the uh, uh, opportunity for us, in fact, to grow up your children correctly uh, eliminates uh, the social costs. And whether it's substance abuse, whether it's prison, whether it's eliminating gangs, uh, the opportunity that we have there to save taxpayers' money and reinvest it is, I think, a, a significant aspect. I'd like to just ask the question, and again, this is such a, an important topic. Uh, we all know the rising generation need uh, help to make sure that they become the best they can be. We're talking here about educating the children, but I'd like to say, who's educating the parents? Uh, when we talk about, you know, birth through three or pre-kindergarten, I have six children, and uh, none of them came with any instructions. <laughs> and uh, I kind of experimented along the way. They all seem to be turning out pretty good, thanks to a, a good mother, uh, the First Lady of Utah. She has in Utah, part of the same thing Governor Inslee has to do with uh, parenting skills. So we have, in fact, an initiative that the First Lady does in Utah on having people come to conferences and through educational seminars and, and not have to reinvent the wheel, but learn from others of, who've done it and say, here's the challenge we had, this is how we handle it, this will help you in raising your own children. But I like to have, you know, how do we, in fact, merge the government responsibility with the parental responsibility, and how do we, in fact, educate parents on how to teach their children to become good, productive citizens? It's a great question, Governor, and um, the Early Steps to School Success Program, which Save the Children runs, is built on that very concept, and I'm sorry we didn't make that clear enough that when the home visitor is going into the home, they're interacting with the parents or guardians in the home. They're teaching them how to read to their kids. Um, as you know, that kind of sounds like a crazy statement, but that is often the case. Uh, and if the parents don't read well, which we deal with on a, on a regular basis, the idea, as Jennifer will tell you, of teaching them how to do nursery rhymes, how to sing to their kids. It's all the stimulation, the, the brain synapses, hearing those words, hearing those lullabies that your wife did just naturally to your kids is all part of the growth cognitively of that little baby. Um, and then working with the family and transitioning them into pre-K <laughs> programs or services in the school. And oftentimes the parents have had bad experiences in the local elementary school where their kid is going to go. So we work on uh, setting up program or setting up experiences in the school for the parent to be reintroduced into the school, uh, to meet the teachers, the principals, to have reading time in the school at, during after school times or on weekends. So there is a strong component of the parent education piece of it, and there's a strong component of trying to build those relationships between the home and the school, which in many cases, as I said, as I said have often been negative in the past. A lot of these families, as you know, in Utah and across the country, there's not a lot of mobility, um, and parents will have a negative experience in, you know, PS 180, their elementary school, and then their kids end up going there, and the teachers are some of the ones that taught them or their younger siblings and had negative experiences. So that's a really key component to it, and I think you ought to ask those tough questions not only to us but to other providers as well. Are they making that connection with the families? It's hard, as you know, and as your wife, who we met last night, told us, it's tough to do, uh, but it's critically important. Do you want to add anything? Uh, Governor Ricketts, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Thank you. I wanted to follow up a little with Mr. Schreiber. So, and this is actually for anybody else who would like to weigh in on this from the, their experiences as well, but 
uh, when, we're, when you're looking at how you measure outcomes, are there three or five things that you can focus on and say, I'm going to make up an example which will demonstrate my ignorance on this, but if the child knows their ABC is going into kindergarten, we know that by the time they take that third grade standardized test that their scores are going to be X percent better. So if we really focus on making sure before they get to kindergarten, they know their ABCs, that's one of the things we want to measure with our pre-K providers. Right? Are, there, are there things like that that we can really focus on at the state to say if we can improve the training or whatever like, and measure those specific things so that when we hit kindergarten, we'll know we'll get better results? Or how do you think about measuring the outcomes for that? Because I know that one of the other challenges is that, you know, standardized tests for kindergartens and pre-kindergartens isn't always the easiest thing. But what are some things you can point us to to, to help us look for that? Well, it's, a, it's again, it's a great question. And um, the, for Save the Children, we use something called the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, which is a comprehensive series of assessments that look at the child cognitively, socially, and emotionally. And the teachers look at it and can judge if the kid is interacting with their peers well, if they're sharing, if they're exhibiting a lot of these um, emotional intelligence uh, behaviors as well as the cognitive behaviors of holding a book, knowing how to flip a page. When I was in the legislature, we had a hearing um, and I asked a series of uh, kindergarten teachers, can you figure out the kids that are going to graduate from high school? And to a person, they will tell you they know what kid is going to graduate from high school and what isn't, which one isn't in kindergarten. So if the kid comes in, and you've, Jennifer's seen this, kid comes in and they don't know how to put the jacket on, they don't know how to hold a book, and they're in five years old, and they're 18 months, as she said, behind a kid who knows all that stuff, you're going to spend billions of dollars, in Nebraska, hundreds of millions of dollars in Nebraska as a country. We're going to be spending billions to try to get that kid up to grade level. And in most cases, it's not going to work. So, Mark, I'm, I'm afraid I do need to interrupt. Um, in Santa Monica, California, where my children are lucky enough to go to school, kindergarten readiness to us is that your child is reading, they can write their name, their numbers, they probably know a song at least in another language. But kindergarten readiness for the families that we serve is about having the patience to listen to a story and sit still. It's about not knowing how to read a book, but knowing what a book is. If there's one book for every poor child in the United States, if there's one, one book for every 13 poor children in the United States, and on average 13 books for every middle class or upper, upper class child in the United States, and imagine how many children's books you all have had in your homes. These, these families don't even have books in their homes. So it is about knowing what a book is. It's not knowing the alphabet, it's knowing that letters exist. It is, it's really a whole concept less than you would even imagine based on what you know as a parent. It, it is really just the very fundamentals. It's about a brain being set up to learn. And I was thinking about a story last week in Palmdale, California. I was on a, on a site visit there and it was a home where English was a second language and there wasn't much English spoken at all. But the mother had three children. Two of them had gone through school without our programs. Her baby was benefiting from our home visitation model. And she had been a parent for a while. She, she had lovely kids, she told me. They just were struggling in school. But her youngest, our home, visit, our home visitor, brought Hot Wheels, Hot Wheel cars. And this little boy, you can imagine, it's kind of like a little boy giddiness, and I felt giddy when I saw them. Who doesn't love a Hot Wheel? And she was showing the mother how to take things around the house, an old box, some toilet paper rolls, to make a garage for the child. And then she said, let's teach him the colors. And she was saying all of this in Spanish to the mother, and they would say the color in Spanish, they'd say it in English, they were counting. She was just showing the mother, educating the mother, encouraging her, and telling her, you can do it, you can do it, you can play with this child in a way that is going to expand his mind and I saw those two flop on their bellies on the floor and do a picture walk through a book that neither of them could read but both of them were giggling and having so much fun and so it is about parent education it's about parent encouragement it's about wrapping your arms around parents who are struggling and it is about um, kindergarten readiness is achievable it is something we can do but it's very difficult to measure unless you're in Santa Monica California where they better be ready to go to Harvard <laughs> could just say one other thing on that. Those games that Jennifer's describing 
are developing a child's fine motor skills. So putting the, the blue thing in the blue hole and the green square in the green square hole are all ways to develop the fine motor skill of the kids. And social scientists will tell you, and brain scans show that when kids are stimulated that way, their brain is actually growing at a faster clip than kids that don't have those experiences. In Washington State, at uh, University of Washington Eye Labs, they do brain scans of kids that get stimulated with those extra words, and it's millions of words difference from a parent who um, is not living in poverty versus one who is. And the brain actually is growing faster. There's a Pat Cool, who Governor Inslee knows well, will come to your state and show you these brain scans. It's amazing. The science now, which was not around when Head Start was started 50 plus years ago, showing how brain growth happens and how these kids will do better in the state of Nebraska and make more money uh, long term. But you're planting a seed that you're probably not going to see blossom as governor. So it takes guts to make that investment because those kids aren't going to be, you know, in high school and college or car mechanics or whatever it is when you're governor. But you're planting those seeds and you're going to be saving your state long term and you're going to be doing economic development work long term. Sorry, Governor Bailey. Thank you, Mark. Uh, our final question uh, comes from Governor Malloy. Uh, thank you, Governor. This has been a great uh, and exciting presentation, and I've enjoyed it uh, immensely. Uh, I, I just want to share uh, an experience. Uh, this is about 20 years ago in, in my home city where I was mayor. Uh, we uh, just, just about 20 years ago this month that we declared that we would provide a, a pre-kindergarten experience for every child in the city regardless of their financial circumstances. Um, and it was based on the research that you were just uh, uh, referencing. But I will also tell you that even in a state that has led on, on kindergarten and, and uh, uh, programs and other uh, preschool programs, the, the thing that we did to really uh, bring this home uh, in 2013 by executive order and 2014 by legislation is create an office of early uh, uh, of the early child. Uh, and it is a cabinet level position with its own commissioner uh, that coordinates the activities of five different departments that touch children uh, early in their age uh, and coordinates activities with uh, a broad array of not-for-profits and coordinates uh, activities with uh, local boards of education uh, as well. Uh, if you really want this to be important in your state, I'd be happy to share with the executive order. I'd have to be happy to get you the legislation. I'd ha be happy to have our uh, Office of Early Child, uh, Childhood Commissioner meet with, with anyone uh, uh, in your state that might be uh, desirous of doing it. But, but when you declare that there is a house for early children, uh, when you declare that this is as, as, as important as anything else in your cabinet, uh, you will be amazed at how quickly people will move uh, and how seriously they'll take your commitment. Thank you, Governor. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Jennifer and Mark. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And, and as I say, your passion uh, for uh, the same passion that we have for uh, improving the lives of children. And so thank you. I, I know that you have to depart. Uh, so thank you for being with us today. Thank you. The, uh, the, the reason uh, I'd, li I'd like to uh, mention uh, as we talk about our programs across the state and, uh, and, and across the country is, as, Go as Governor Malloy just uh, mentioned, uh, in Alabama, we actually have uh, an Office of School Readiness, and it is under the governor's office. It's not under the Department of Education. Uh, and that makes a tremendous difference. Uh, it takes away a lot of the bureaucracy uh, that we have in, in our state departments of education. Uh, in, in Alabama, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, what, what we really do. We, uh, uh, we have gone, since I've been governor six years, we've gone from 6% uh, enrollment to 25. And as we reach the 50% level, then every parent who wants their child to go to a first class pre-K program will have that opportunity. 
We have worked very hard on quality and not on quantity. Uh, and that's why that we're the, one of only two states uh, that has, for the last 10 years, uh, met uh, this first class level, uh, that's, uh, this award that's given through the National Institute for Early Education Research. Uh, we have put a special emphasis, as I say, on the quality of our programs. These are grant programs, some of the uh, programs that do not uh, do what they should do. They, they have their grant taken away from them. Uh, and so they're expected to, to do exactly what they're supposed to do, and, and we're seeing results. You know, as, as I say in Alabama, if you can't uh, prove it, we don't pay for it. And, and I think that we need to take money away from programs that don't work. And, and so if, if you can show statistically, and we can show it, we can show statistically that it truly works. And we're very proud of our program. I've got a great uh, commissioner who, who deals with this. She has done a fantastic job. Uh, and, and we're going to continue to uh, work hard in Alabama to reach that level so that every parent will have the opportunity to voluntarily send their child to a first-class uh, pre-K program. Now I would like to introduce uh, our next guest, uh, Mike Petters. Uh, Mr. Petters is president and CEO of Huntington in Ingalls Industries. Uh, this is uh, America's largest military shipbuilding company, and he's also a, their company is a provider of manufacturing and engineering and management services to the nuclear energy, oil, and gas markets. He's also a member of the steering committee for Blueprint Virginia, which is a strategic planning initiative spearheaded by the Virginia Chamber of Commerce that pursues multiple goals related to early childhood education. Now, those goals include improving access to high quality early learning programs and also for identifying opportunities for public and private partnerships. In addition, he has part participated in the work of the Hamilton Project which is a DC-based organization seeking to advance America's promise for opportunity, prosperity, and growth uh, with, with a special focus on including and eliminating the poverty gap, which our pre-K programs do. And uh, the school readiness is a major part of this. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Mike Petters. Before Mike speaks, I would also like to give a special recognition to Mr. Petters, who has 22,000 employees in the Commonwealth of Virginia. But his company, as you know, every aircraft carrier ever built in the history of this great country was built at his company. And we were very proud, and we have several under construction, the largest naval base in the world. So to a great Virginian, I want to thank you, Mike. And a great United States Naval Academy grad. Well, thanks, Governor. I, I, um you know, I'm, I'm here today as the, uh, the CEO of Huntington Ingalls Industries, a Fortune 500 company. Um, I'm not exactly sure who set me up on the agenda to follow that first, uh, first <laughs> thing. So, um, and I heard one time that everything that needs to be said has been said already, but not by everybody who needs to say it. And so I'm going to try to fulfill my obligation in that regard. Um, you know, as a public company CEO, uh, I'm really familiar with safe harbor uh, statements. And so my first safe harbor statement is, I am not a professional educator. I'm a businessman. Uh, I happen to be married to a professional educator who teaches three-year-olds. I have, my wife and I have two daughters who teach in elementary education. And so there are professional educators in my household, but I'm uniquely unqualified to talk about that. Um, secondly, I'd like to recognize that, uh, as Governor McAuliffe said, uh, we are the largest industrial site of employment in the state of, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We are also the largest employer in the state of Mississippi at, at our Ingalls Shipbuilding Facility in Pascagoula. And Governor Bennett, I actually believe we're the largest employer in your state because 3,000 of our shipbuilders that work in Pascagoula live in Alabama. So, um, but beyond that, uh, we actually have a built in America supply chain that represents 5,000 suppliers across all 50 states. And so to commemorate all of your role in the great shipbuilding enterprise, uh, we've actually stuck in your folder a little, a little poster that we made that actually shows a carrier with uh, state flags on it. Because 
when one of our sailors is riding a ship and it goes over the horizon in harm's way, uh, that ship may have come from one of the shipyards in Mississippi or Virginia, but it actually represents every, every part of our country and every fabric of our being and represents everything that we do together very well. And so uh, we're honored to be the place where all that comes together, but we absolutely recognize that all of you are shipbuilders, and, and we're very glad and very proud of the partnership that we have with each one of you. Now, I'm here as a businessman, and I want to give you just a little bit of uh, perspective on this. Um, I was sitting at the Naval War College a few years ago, and, and uh, Secretary of the Navy was uh, Ray Mavis, former governor of Mississippi. And he made the statement that if you take the population of this country today from the ages of 18 to 24 years old, and you take out of that population, you take out the folks who do not have a high school diploma, who have had some kind of criminal activity, or who have some sort of, of uh, physical fitness issue that would preclude them from being joining the armed services, you are left with, in that population of 18 to 24, you are left with 25% uh, of that population is actually eligible to be recruited into our armed services, 25%. Now, I was kind of staggered by that sitting in the audience because as I sat there and I listened to what he talked about, you know, when he talked about uh, high school diplomas or GEDs, he talked about criminal records. When he was talking about the physical thing, he was talking about obesity, things that were in our control. Um, I actually thought for a minute that, uh, you know, those are all the same people I'm trying to recruit as a businessman. He's trying to recruit them. I'm trying to recruit them. What are we doing with the other 75%? And um, about a month later, I was actually in one of my daughter's classrooms, uh, and she was teaching fifth grade at the time. And that voice kind of came back to me that said, one in four is going to be employable. One in four is going to be paying for all of the things that you have to pay for for the other three. And I looked at our classroom of 30 students and thought one in four, even, even I can do the math, said there's probably seven or eight kids in here who are going to carry the load for the rest of the classroom. So I'm not surprised by the comment, and my wife would say the same thing, that you can tell in, in kindergarten the kids that have got it and are going to go, and you can tell the kids that don't have it and are not going to go. And so that starts to say that maybe there's something that we need to do just from a, you know, the, being the business side of these things, there's some things that we need to do to make sure that when those ships go over the horizon 25, 30 years from now, that they still represent the best of what America can offer. The second thing I would say is that uh, thinking about it from the business standpoint, what we know about shipbuilding is that if it costs us a dollar to build something in a shop, if we have to move it out of the shop and then build it, instead of building it in the shop, we build it out in the weather in, the, in what we call a platen area, which is an exposed area before it goes to the ship in the, in the dock area, it's like three or four times as much to, to build it in that less hospitable environment. And if you can't build it until you actually get the ship in the water, it can cost five to eight times as much to build it. And I step back and, you know, we're the largest employer in a couple of states. We're heavily involved in the workforce development pipeline of, of trying to find employees. And I look at what we're investing to take people who have graduated from high school, who have the ability to come to work for us, and then I think about all the money that we're trying to spend in that area to make sure that they are actually employable on our behalf. And I think that, you know, if we could start spending that money on the front end of the pipeline, we would actually get a pretty large return on an investment. And so we think a lot about, in our, in our business, we think about the 138 rule. Our suppliers that are in your states, they provide us the most efficient way for the products that we need to build those ships. Um, why can't we think about our, our educational system as a pipeline as, at well, as well? And as we're putting all of this money in at the end of the pipeline to try to fix what's coming out of the pipe, wouldn't it make sense that we put some money up on the front end of the pipeline and invest in that to make sure that the, pro, it'd be a, the, the return would be pretty significant and pretty substantial, I think. And so that seems to make some sort of logical sense to me. Um, I've heard and read, and I think that we heard some statistics earlier about some of the, uh, 
the, the return on investment or the, the different things that go there. I think you can find all kinds of studies that will give you all kinds of numbers. I've heard 16% ROI. I've heard $30,000 for each student. I, I mean, I've heard all kinds of numbers. I've never heard anybody say it was a bad investment. I mean, I get a lot of, like, I get a lot of folks bringing ideas to me all the time, just like you, and if it doesn't make sense, we say no. I have never had anybody be able to present to me a case where this is, this is, a, this is nothing but a straight up good investment to make. The third thing I would say is that we are right now in our, in our society, in manufacturing and in industry, we are looking at um, the change of the workday. What it means to work for someone and what it means to, to be an employee for someone for your career is changing rapidly. What you knew when you started working at the age of 20 or 18 or 16 or 25 will not carry you all the way to the time that you are ready to retire. You're going to actually have to become, the workforce of the future is going to have to be a workforce that loves learning and is excited about the opportunity to try to do something new. And one thing my wife would say is that when she gets her three-year-old class, she thinks that the, her objective in the year that she has those kids is to somehow take them and unlock their love for learning. And if we can unlock the love for learning in kids that are three, four, five years old, we are setting ourselves up for great success 25, 30, 50 years from now. Now, why would a businessman who has to deal with quarterly results care about what's going to happen 50 years from now? I mean, besides being a good citizen and all that sort of thing? Well, last month we signed a contract to build a ship that will deliver to the Navy, the USS Enterprise, again, it will deliver to the Navy in 2027. In 2052, the ship will come back to the shipyard to be refueled. And in 2077, the ship will come back to the shipyard to be inactivated. So I'm probably the, the Fortune 500 CEO with the longest horizon because I can tell you what dock and what pier the enterprise is going to be at in 2077 when we go to do that work. But I would suggest to you that for all of the horizon that I have, it is my view that the government, actually government service and government activity should have the longest horizon of us all. And, if, and, and in those places where uh, it doesn't make sense for the private sector to step in, the government has to kind of make that make sense because it's got a long-term horizon on it. And if you can get the kind of returns that we're talking about here uh, over that kind of time frame, then I think the sailors 50 years from now uh, and the country 50 years from now will be in a good place. Absent that, we're going to be the, we're going to be the country that has ships where we're not going to be able to put people on it because they're not going to be qualified to sail them. And we'll be lucky to have ships because we may not have a workforce that's qualified to build them. So with that, I'm... That's kind of my opening, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, That's a long time. You, you, you're, you're doing what, Mike, you're doing what uh, we're doing on the state level. We're trying to, uh, you know, recruit jobs and, and retain jobs and doing the, we have to have a workforce. And, and if we don't build that workforce with education on a strong foundation, then we're not going to have a strong workforce. I, it, I, I can't see why people can't get this. You know, it's just, it's just hard for me to believe that people don't understand that the most important part of learning is in the early years. Because just like you talked about, it, it makes children want to learn. And that's a lifelong, that's a lifelong goal. So right. thank you. And, and what we'll do is have just a couple of questions. Governor Ducey. Mike, <clears throat> thank you very much for your, your service and your commitment in uh, the state of Virginia. I'm curious, what can we do to incentivize business owners and CEOs to make the same type of commitment in our states to th the, the worthy work you're working on? Um, I think that uh, actually this, uh, across the board, I think each of you probably know, know what incentivizes companies in your area. I mean, different things work for different folks and different states are going to have different approaches. I would tell you that from a public company standpoint, uh, cash is king. And so if you're able to incentivize 
companies in a way that helps them with their cash flow, their cash profile, um, to make these investments uh, in some ways, then I think that that can be very, very helpful, whether it's credits or um, uh, you know, deductions, how, however it works best in your state, I think makes the most sense. Uh, part, you know, partnerships, public-private partnerships I've seen are starting to work pretty well in, in lots of different parts of the, the government business interface. And so I think that there's, a, there's probably a range of alternatives there. Um, what we've done is we've actually, last year, we went so far as to, um, we gave out 30, over 30 scholarships to children of employees to go to preschool. Now, we don't know that those 30 kids are going to come work for us in 15 or 20 years. But, you know, there's an I believe button in here that says that we start down that path. If we get a 30 to 1 or 15 to 1 return on that investment in our community, that's going to be good for our business and that's going to be good for, for the states that we're in uh, and, for, and for the country. And so we will do that again. We just announced the program again this year and we're our, our, our employees are submitting their applications. I can't tell you, I, I can't tell you with as much uh, emotion and passion as you heard earlier, but I get the thank you notes from the parents whose kids are going to school who would not have been going to school but for the scholarship program that we're offering. You know, and so we're, we're very excited about that and I think that, uh, you know, my encouragement is actually for business leaders to step up and move their horizons out a little bit. Governor Bevin. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mike, again for, for being here, for caring enough uh, to share your thoughts and for channeling uh, the informed members of your family as well. I uh, truly appreciate that. I, I just, we're not going to resolve what I'm going to ask here in this discussion, but I want us to think about, because you made mention of something a moment ago, Mr. Shriver, before you as well, you talked about the fact that you're able to help uh, folks in your company uh, to send their children to preschool. I think every one of us understands, and all science, 100% of it, reinforces the fact that the cognitive development, the firing of little synapses, and the creation of metal ink starts early, and the more the better at an early age. I think everyone agrees to that. And you're able to help facilitate that as a possibility for employees, and others have variations on that theme. Mr. Schreiber made mention of a program that's probably the most prevalently used, and that's the Head Start program. Mm -hmm. The question I would like us to ask ourselves as governors, all of us, regardless of our ideology, regardless of the prevalence of Head Start in our states or not. Head Start began in 1965. We've pumped about 200 and some odd billion dollars into that program. The last time anybody truly looked at the efficacy of that, to my knowledge, Congress actually asked Health and Human Services to look at this. It was about eight years ago. And they did an exhaustive study. They, over the course of several years, gathered data they looked at 5,000 children, five, very scientifically robust, randomly selected, half of whom went into Head Start and half of whom did not. And they followed them from the Head Start age, the preschool age, up through first, second, third grade. And what they found is by the first grade, frankly, any academic advantage had begun to dissipate. By third grade and beyond, zero impact, no difference whatsoever, and in fact saw some negative differences as it related to those children and their ability to assimilate socially, which is also an important thing for employers to think about. Because there is no substitute for parents, and yet not every parent has a home, as we just heard, where this is possible. So the question I would ask us to begin to ask ourselves, and I would think maybe at the NGA, we would think about focusing like a laser on this by creating subsets among ourselves who could understand how best we can use the hundreds of billions of dollars because we're 52 years into this and there's never been a study. Not only was that the most recent, there has never been a study sanctioned by the government or any outside entity that has ever proven that there's any efficacy whatsoever to those hundreds of billions of dollars beyond the third grade. And if we all know, and all the facts also show, that a child not performing at a third grade level is not a child who's going to be able to, in all likelihood, compete well at higher levels. So then what are we pumping the money into? We all agree it's got to happen. We all know it needs to happen. There's no scientific evidence that would refute that. So I guess the question we need to ask ourselves is where does the money go? And that is one where we as governors should demand of Congress 
where we're sending our money, getting it channeled back to us through programs that are arguably good, have all good intent, but are proving no actual value add, the question we need to ask ourselves, what is the better mousetrap and what responsibility do we have as states to do some of the very things you're doing within your company, with other governors and what they're doing within their respective states? How can we take best practices and rethink the idea that we're throwing hundreds of billions of dollars into a hole and we're getting nothing in return? And it's great in theory and everyone's for it, but we are wasting money and we are compromising the ability for that ship to come into harbor in 2077 and have anybody who's capable of handling what needs to be done to it. So it's a, again, we're not gonna resolve it here. It's something we truly would be delegating, we're derelict in our duties if we don't look at this seriously and come up with solutions because frankly, we're gonna drive it and not Congress. Governor, Be Governor, Governor Bevin, I'd like to uh, answer that also in, in Alabama. And as I say, for the last 10 years, we have been ranked in the top two in the country. We actually partner with Head Start. We add our program to Head Start to make Head Start a good program. Now, Head Start is not a good program. Statistically, you're exactly right. But we have the statistics in Alabama to prove that what we're doing in our state is actually working. But we give the grant on top of the Head Start grant, and we actually work with churches, we work with Head Start. We work with public education, most of them public education. The other thing that, that I am pushing in Alabama right now is the development of a degree in higher education, not kindergarten through sixth grade, but birth through third grade. Because unless we expand what we're doing in the pre-K programs in Alabama to the kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, they are losing some of that. But if you get them at the third grade level, if they can read and know their math, they are on their way. And that's what we're, that's what we're doing. And we're working with higher ed to, to develop those degrees, looking at it at a different grade level. The other thing that we're doing, we, we are teaching parents how to be teachers and, and let them do it in their home. So we, we have a program, it's called uh, Parents as Teachers. And so we're doing that in the homes, and so I think that's making a difference also. You're right about Head Start. There are, there are no statistics, but we have statistics on our first class pre-K program that truly shows that it works. And, and so we're, we're happy to share that with any state or anybody in the country because uh, we, we've, we've had some great gains. Let me just simply say, and this is exactly what I'm talking about, we best practices, channeling things that work, scaling those, in, in using those more nationally so that we're not coming alongside something that's broken and trying at additional cost to fix it as you're doing and doing well. But how can we not only learn from that, and maybe, maybe that is it, maybe you replicate that, but at a price that's maybe more than if you were to actually start from scratch using the knowledge and insight and successes that you've had. And again, it's a challenge I'm throwing out to us as an organization if we're to have a real effect, and indeed they demand of us, the people that send us here in these respective roles that we do it, then we need to ask hard questions like this and be willing to, to again, learn from best practices and benchmark off things that are happening in Alabama and other states. And I just I challenge us to think about this because it's, the, we're losing this battle. And Mike, you're speaking to this. I mean, we're losing this battle, unfortunately, despite all good intent all agreement that it needs to be done in a tremendous amount of money to make it happen. And we can't afford to lose. Mike, thank you for being with us today and, uh, and, and sharing with, with us on, on a, a, a level that, uh, that, that deals with economic development because uh, workforce training, and we've got to look at the beginning just like you're talking about for workforce training. So thank you for that. Uh, and I'll also, I'd like to thank all of our presenters who uh, have, have been with us today. And, uh, my fellow governors, thank you for your questions. Uh, I, I'd like to say that on uh, June the 11th and the 12th of this year in Denver, Colorado, uh, we will convene the 2017 Governor's Education Symposium. Now this, this meeting will uh, bring governors together and uh, we, we, will we want to learn from each other uh, at that meeting. So any of you who would like to attend, uh, please be in touch with uh, Stephen Parker. Uh, and now what I will do is, I, I, unless there are any, any further questions, then I will turn the program back over to Governor McAuliffe. 
Let's give uh, Governor Bentley and Governor Inslee a great round of applause if we could. I uh, thank them for their great leadership. Uh, let me mention the governors. We have an addition to the calendar tomorrow. Last week I was out speaking at the RSA Cyber Conference. I had a private meeting with Admiral Rogers. He had some very important information. I asked him if he would come to our meeting. Uh, Admiral Rogers, as you know, is the director of the National Security Agency, the commander of the U.S. Cyber Command, and the chief of select services. And he's agreed to come tomorrow. Governors only meeting tomorrow. Secure briefing. If you want to do it, it'll be at 3 o'clock to 345 tomorrow in the Treasury Room if you would like to meet with uh, Admiral Rogers. And he moved his schedule around so that he could be here uh, for the governors, and I thank him for doing that. Uh, if you're interested in attending, please let Anna Davis know here, and she will write all the names down as we go forward. Before we go, I know we have a couple of the new governors in and out. I'd like to give them 30 seconds so we all know one another. Uh, we'll start, Governor Scott, a little uh, welcome, and uh, great to have you here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, tremendous honor for me to be here, uh, as well as my wife, Diana. Uh, you've shown us uh, such support and a warm welcome. Uh, I really appreciate that. I also appreciate the bipartisan nature of this uh, organization. I worked with the uh, National uh, Lieutenant Governors Association for a few years previous and uh, found the same uh, uh, outreach of respect and so forth. Uh, in Vermont, I, I'm known as a, a pretty successful stock car racer. I've been racing for the last 30 years. I uh, continue to race. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm negotiating my security at this very moment to see if they're going to let me continue to race. I'm thinking maybe a blue light out in front of me uh, might allow me to win a race or two in the future. But I'm also a, a very avid uh, cyclist. I cycle about 4,000 miles a year. We have a short season up there, about six, seven months. So it shows you the diversity of Vermont in many different ways. Another example would be uh, Bernie Sanders and Phil Scott being elected in the same year. Uh, that's, uh, that's another sign of diversity. Uh, 20, 20 years ago, I didn't have a politi political bone in my body. I had no interest in politics whatsoever. I was a frustrated business owner. I've been in business for 30-something years in the construction industry. Uh, but I, uh, I, I started complaining a lot about what they then were doing to me right down the street at the legislature. Finally, I got tired of, of complaining enough, so I stepped up to run myself, served uh, five terms in the Senate, uh, six, uh, three terms in the, as lieutenant governor, now as governor, and sometimes I still feel as though they don't get it, uh, but, uh, but that's uh, the political reality. Um, but I've always treated people with respect and civility. It's, I've served in the minority my entire political life, uh, but it's something that, uh, that has proved uh, to be, uh, make me successful. But I listen to others, treat them with respect and civility, and I get something done as a result. And I think that uh, when we see the polarization across uh, the, the America and here in D.C., uh, I believe that we can lead by example, and I think this organization can help do that. So I thank you very much for having me here, and I look forward to getting to know you better over the next couple of years. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> America's newest governor from the great state of South Carolina, Governor Haley is now ensconced at the U.N., and now we have the great Governor uh, McMaster with us. Thank you, Governor. I'm happy to be here. I appreciate the warm welcome. And on behalf of uh, Peggy and our family, we uh, have delighted in making some new friends and seeing some old ones back from the Reagan administration. This is a great organization. I was uh, Attorney General for eight years. That was a great organization, these meetings. This, this group of, of governors, of course, is the group that really has their fingers on the pulse of the issues facing the country. And not only are we, are you, involved in making the laws, but also in implementing them and seeing what works and what doesn't. So it looks to me like we've got a great opportunity in our country now. People are looking for leadership and from the kinds of conversations I've been listening to and some from afar over the years, I've got great confidence in this organization if we can, if we can stick together and make suggestions and do things that will work for the country. So on behalf of myself as well as Peggy, we're delighted to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Uh, the next two, interesting, uh, both their parents were governors of their respective states. It's an honor to have from the great state of New Hampshire, Chris Noonan, who's here with us today. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I, I was sitting here thinking uh, when we were going through this initial session on early childhood development, early childhood education, 
it is a great example of, uh, of understanding what the priorities are, making sure that when we do come together about governors, we don't talk about fluff. We actually talk about things that matter. Um, you know, we can talk about policy all day, but I think to Governor Bevan's point earlier, uh, it's often about dollars, about implementation, about results, about outcomes. And uh, that's the, uh, the burden and the responsibility that governors bear over other legislators. Um, but one we take on, I think, with great seriousness. And uh, again, just to see the NGA get kicked off in such a positive way, I think is just a great example and testament uh, of the leadership that we have as part of this group. Um, and I think of, of what we can do and what we're willing to do to actually make, uh, make all of our states uh, better for our citizens. So thank you again on behalf of my wife, Valerie, and myself. Uh, it is great to be here, great to be part of, uh, part of the group. Uh, much more modernized than, uh, than I remember when running around the halls here at, uh, back in 1987. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, which is, uh, I, I think, again, a great testament to really always moving the ball forward and keeping uh, our eye on the prize. Thank you, Chris. The great Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, Governor Rossell. Well, thank you. Good morning to all. On behalf of my wife, uh, Beatrice, and myself, we're happy to be here. And before you ask, uh, no, I am not the junior staffer. I am actually the governor of Puerto Rico. <laughs> It's been a funny uh, couple of events. Uh, they've actually saluted some of my staff as the governor, so I sort of go a little bit under the radar. But uh, only 54 days on the job, we've been able to pass through uh, 15 structural reforms in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, we're very excited. It's a challenging job, as, as you, most of you know, Puerto Rico is going through uh, some tough times. Uh, we're about to submit a fiscal oversight plan within the next uh, 72 hours. We would like to ask uh, uh, support of this organization uh, as we push forward. Uh, so as you can see with so many challenges, uh, people have said or have wondered if I am crazy for taking uh, this job. Uh, why would a neuroscientist uh, jump into politics? Well, what we discussed today is uh, a particular reason why I jumped into politics. Uh, seeing that the overwhelming science shows that, you know, growth and learning from zero to three is, is out there, it's, it's compelling, uh, but we're not doing uh, nearly as much about it as we should be doing. I, I you know, ponder the following question, how do we uh, stipulate to all the people, uh, to all the leaders, how important uh, these sorts of issues are how can we make it one of the mainstream issues? Uh, how can we quantify it? And not only think about this in the short-term implication or the long-term implications that it'll have in terms of, of giving you know, opportunities to the children, but quantifying the quality of life element uh, to the parents in the mid to short term uh, that, that this happens. So uh, all of these questions are wonderful. Would like to uh, be a very integral part of this organization. And you're all welcome to Puerto Rico. Let us host you when you're out there. Thank you, Richard. For Governor McMaster is the 55th. You know, we have 55 states and territories. We have with us the 54th. Took a little few time after Election Day, but the new governor of the great state of North Carolina, Roy Cooper, is here with us today. Thank you, Governor McAuliffe. I'd always heard you were a shrinking violet, and I guess that's not true. Uh, gre greetings from North Carolina. People ask me what I want at the end of the day from this job, and I often say I want a North Carolina that is better educated, that's healthier, that has more money in their pockets, and that they have opportunities to live a more abundant and purposeful life. That's what I want. That's what I've told cabinet secretaries that I have interviewed and people who come to work for this administration. It's been a great first 56 days as governor. I'm delighted to come here and be a part of this organization. I think we've probably never been as polarized politically as we are now, uh, both in my state of North Carolina and across the country. And I think what people want more than ever are people who are willing to sit down, roll up their sleeves, and find out, okay, where can we agree? Where can we achieve consensus? And I think that this organization is one where we can help to forge those areas of 
consensus. We'll, we'll agree, disagree when we know we need to and stand up for our beliefs. But there's so many areas where I think we can work together for the betterment of the people in our respective states and territories. So I'm glad to be here. I practiced law for a number of years. I was in the state legislature. I also served as attorney general. So I'm, I'm ready to do this job, and I'm ready to take advice from, from all of you about how I can do it better. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Roy. We will convene uh, as soon as this meeting ends, governor's only lunch. We are going to start out with the five standing committees. We have been working tirelessly in the NGA staff. We're going to vote on these, so we have a very big, lengthy agenda, so I'd ask you to be on time so we can move through that. And then Frank Luntz uh, will come in in the second part of our lunch and to go through a national poll that he's just completed. Thank you. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>